DLC was first invented back in 1986. Back then, it stood for Dave Lombardo is cool, in tribute to the Slayer drummer who could pull off tons of face shredding fills out of the same familiar pieces of kit. Today, that fact is long forgotten. But that same spirit lives on in the paid expansions of video game developers. We're taking a look back at the best and worst DLC of 2016, the releases that left us content and the ones that turned out to be downers. If you see what I did there. Oh, you did? Well, then um, just feel free to start laughing whenever you're ready. <clears throat> right. Well, let's start with the good. Remember, you can always subscribe if you think we're all right, too. Sometimes games end. I know, it's an embarrassing issue that the games industry is working round the clock to fix. But in the meantime, we've got top draw DLC, like The Witcher 3's Blood and Wine, to fill the void. CD Projekt were at the top of their game by the end of The Witcher 3's dev cycle, writing quests more twisty and knotted than that horrible whispering tree on the second map. The expertise really shows in this fully fledged swan song to Geralt of Rivia. The title refers to both vampires and alcohol, which turns out to be the perfect recipe for a good time. If Pillars of Eternity was Obsidian's tribute to Baldur's Gate, and it was, they said it, so no, then this expansion is their version of Icewind Dale. Not only does the White March take place in the crystalline frozen north, it also strips back the storytelling to expose the tactical combat engine that Pillars runs on. Like any good dungeon, the White March chips away at your party members with monsters and spells, leaving them stronger, better defined personalities. Part 1 didn't exactly have an ending, but the second half tied things up in a much more climactic fashion. Almost as if Obsidian knew what they were doing. Huh. The Dark Souls series has something of a reputation for good DLC, and Ashes of Ariandel certainly didn't damage it. These levels look absolutely beautiful, in the gothic European way that From Software somehow do better than the Europeans themselves. And beyond that, Ariandel's painted world is packed full of Vikings, wolves, and gnarly hellscapes to enjoy. The bosses deal out unfathomable amounts of damage, but that doesn't matter when you've memorized their attack patterns and expertly dodged them all. Am I right? Yeah, right. Trust me, if you say it with conviction enough times, you almost start to believe you can do it. Did you know? There's a secret formula to working out your Forza DLC name. Take your most hated weather event and combine it with your favourite geographical feature. I'm Drizzle Plateau, but you might be Black Ice Ravine, or in this case, Blizzard Mountain. Like most of the best DLC in 2016, Blizzard Mountain covers its parent game in icing sugar, lacing the roads of Australia with treacherous snow and blinding storms. It's amazing fun. In fact, I think I'll go back to it right now. <clears throat> Dashing through the snow in a TTS coupe, over the hills we go, drifting all the way. Ah, oversteer, my old friend. One of the nice things about the Steam age of PC gaming is all the expansions we've been getting for some of our neglected classics. The latest is Siege of Dragonspear, a whole new RPG campaign that slots neatly into the gap between the existing Baldur's Gate games. It's made by Beamdog, a studio set up by a Bioware co-founder to build the Baldur's Gate Enhanced Editions. There's probably no one else on Earth who could still wrangle the Infinity Engine the way they do. Dragonspear is a rollicking adventure, if you can get over the distant isometric perspective, that is. What is this? A game for ants? Fallout 4's final DLC pack of the year had a gruelling opening sequence, as if designed to put off all but its most dedicated fans. But the reward was a super inventive setting, one that juxtaposed the post-apocalyptic wasteland with Disneyland's, well, Disneyland's post-apocalyptic wasteland. Nuka World doesn't think twice about throwing talking bottle caps and bloated bloodworms at you in the same minute, mixing the family-friendly with actual living nightmares. It's really reactive too. If you don't fancy leading a band of raiders to attack the same settlements you built in the first place, you can simply start shooting up the place. Nuka World responds by making that your new main quest. It's always nice when someone accommodates your murders, isn't it? And now it's on to the worst DLC of 2016. I take no pleasure in it, but it's my solemn professional duty to pour scorn from a great height over these mishaps in extended content. All right, maybe I do enjoy it a bit. Bombs away! Everybody adored Doom's single player campaign. They emerged happy, soaked in blood, and ready for more multiplayer arena maps. Wait, that's not right, is it? 
There was nothing wrong with the multiplayer exactly, but it's not the reason Doom was hailed as id's great comeback. Why then has the DLC been a big unwanted bag of multiplayer maps, weapons and taunts? It's frustrating, and you know what I like to do when I'm frustrated? Play Doom single player. See the problem? Street Fighter has always been a bit effy on the costume front with its pneumatic boobs and creepy upskirt tendencies, but Christmas only seemed to bring out the worst in it. Capcom reimagined the tradition for children, the Santa costume, as an impractically furry swimwear line for professional fighters. It's baffling to think of the artist sitting for hours on end drawing this stuff without ever once stopping to think, I'm a blithering idiot, aren't I? Imagine if the games industry had looked at Oblivion's horse armour and gone, that's brilliant that is, there's the platform we want to build on for the future. If it had, all DLC would be like Rise of the Tomb Raiders. Not only does it divvy up costumes, weapons and cards into piecemeal packs, but those same costumes actually influence how the game plays. If you're wearing the raggedy Apex Predator outfit, for instance, you're going to take less damage from animals, thereby throwing off the game's carefully curated balance. And you're probably going to smell of wolf and all. Disgusting. What do we want? Now for Super XCOM! When do we want them? On second thoughts, we're not too fussed about that actually. What we really want from XCOM 2 DLC is a meaty expansion on the level of the last game's Enemy Within. Something to really sink our teeth into and justify starting a whole new campaign. Why would I pay for the bare-chested waistcoat look? My squad is at Earth's best hope of salvation, not cartoon genies. And that's a wrap. Had any strong feelings about a bit of DLC that came out in 2016? Let us know in the comments and hit subscribe for a season pass to PC Games N that'll cost you absolutely nothing.